Honorable Navdeep Baines, welcome to the Canadian Congress. Oh, thank you so much, Alex. Uh, what a kind introduction and uh, looking forward to our conversation today. Uh, as you said, we've got a lot in common. You worked at the bank. I work at CIBC as well. And and what we're going to talk about today with regards to diversity and inclusion and workplace equity and how we can move the dial, so to speak, I'm really looking forward to uh, doing a deep dive on some of those issues. Yes. So uh, my very first question, if you allow me, uh, why? Why do you have to make yourself uncomfortable? Why do you have to step out? Why do you have to be the voice? There's many people in parliament. Why do you have to take uh, internet to the rural community? Why, like, why do you have to speak up? You've been harassed at the airport, you spoke up. Some just says, you know, that's what it is and they move on. Um, so why are you a social justice advocate despite that you, you could just sit down in a beautiful house in Richmond Hill and just be sipping on, on your wine with your family? Uh, you know, it's, it's a good question, and it really speaks to my upbringing. Uh, my mm -hmm. father came here in 1972 with literally $5 to his name, and he was provided opportunities to live the middle-class dream, started his own business, raised his family, uh, basically now is able to retire uh, and live a good life in retirement because of the opportunities afforded to him. And as he would describe, coming to Canada was like winning the lottery. And so I I talk to him and my mom as well often, and, and it becomes abundantly clear that to your point, it's very easy to be comfortable and basically enjoy the good life. But we owe a lot to people before us who paved the way for the opportunities that my father and my mother and our entire family has had. And there are many opportunities, but there are also many challenges that exist. So that's why I got involved in politics is really under that notion of equality of opportunity uh, and making sure that everyone at least is given a fair chance to succeed and that the doors are genuinely open for them. And I can tell you right now, uh, even though I had an amazing upbringing, I grew up in Jane and Finch, then moved to Brampton, now raising my two daughters uh, in Mississauga, I still go to rooms where I'm the only person of color. Mm. I am still... Um, you know, the first minister of innovation, science and industry that was a person of color. So in many ways, it's exciting to be the first, but it's also disappointing why I'm the first. And it's also frustrating to still be in a position where I stand out as someone who's the exception and not the norm. And so we got to change that because it doesn't reflect our society. And ultimately, it's not the inclusive environment we want to create for people to succeed and ultimately for our businesses to succeed. Wow. Wow. Thank you uh, very much for sharing that. Considering that whether you have a job or not, whether you're a minister or not, or you're an uh, executive or not, you will still be social justice uh, and trying to make change. You were in the government and now you are in the highest corridors of power, as I call it, in corporate Canada. So from the corridors of power in the government to the corridors of power in corporate Canada, and I'm sure you see uh, that there's uh, uh, imbalanced representation. We talk a lot about balanced representation, but there's imbalanced representation. What would you say are the fundamental differences with regards to leveraging power for change in the government and leveraging power for change in the corporate Canada? So, for example, in 2015, when Prime Minister Trudeau formed government, he came forward with what they call the 50-50 cabinet gender parity. And so I think leadership matters, uh, setting the tone matters uh, when it comes to not only diversity, but diversity in all its forms. And then also when it comes to dealing with some of the gender inequities that exist. And I can say that that sets the tone for the organization. And we're starting to see some changes in government in terms of bureaucracy, in terms of public appointments, in terms of uh, how they engage with, for example, as you mentioned, the indigenous community that Connect to Innovate program was all about dealing with that digital divide between urban and rural Canada, and then particularly focused on indigenous communities that were being left further behind in this new data, digital driven economy. And so I think setting the tone and then that really puts in motion the policies and the programs where you can start to see the change. And it's important to measure that. And the same applies for corporate Canada. 
uh, one of the initiatives that I pushed forward as a minister, uh, and I know it's been discussed earlier today as well, is the 50-30 challenge. That's right. And this is again about saying, look, we got to do better when it comes to gender representation on boards and better when it comes to dealing with diversity and diversity in all its aspects. And why that's important is because, as, as you mentioned, I was the Minister of Innovation. And innovation is about challenging the status quo. Mm -hmm. It's about finding solutions. Uh, it's about identifying new opportunities. And the way you do that is you want people from different perspectives, different points of views, different backgrounds, uh, coming together and solving some of these initiatives and driving that innovation. And so that's why it's really important. It's about how we can improve outcomes for society, how we can improve outcomes for our own communities and our own families. And so I think, uh, you know, diversity is important. And to your point, seeing that reflected in government at the leadership level and at the leadership level in the bank is important, but it's not perfect. No. If you look at some of the senior roles and positions still within public service, it doesn't reflect the rich diversity we have in Canada. And I would say the same applies to corporate Canada, including the bank as well. Um, and so, yes, there's been some very important steps that have been taken, but much more needs to be done. And that's why the 5030 initiative for me was so important, because it sets clear targets and it puts the onus on governments to work with the private sector to, again, see demonstrable outcomes. Okay, and I'm glad you bring that up. We had uh, Dr. Wendy Suki earlier on in the morning. She spoke yep. about it. We just had Nancy Mitchell also spoke about it. Um, you were in the government when you initiated that. Uh, now, some of us will say, but government have all the power. Why Why don't you just legislate it? <laughs> why suggest it? Why suggest it's such an initiative uh, that will change the game for many people when we can when we make laws and say, don't go 50 in this zone, drive 80 in this zone. So why don't we tell the corporations and say, here's the zone. We, I know there's some legislation against federally legislated uh, organizations like CIBC. You need to hire this much people you need to have this much people so why didn't we just take it to that level it's it's again a very um important point that you raised um and the way i approached it was to say look let's first use the legislative tools that we have so i brought changes through legislation around comply and explain mm. and that basically means if you are a company you must have a diversity policy and in that diversity policy, you might must spell out very clearly, according to the Employment Equity Act, what you're going to do in all those areas to improve the outcomes and have targets. And if and if you don't have a policy in place, you better explain that to your shareholders. So either you comply and you put this policy in, in motion and, and you're held accountable for the outcomes, or you have to explain to your shareholders why you don't have uh, such a plan. And that can cause some problems in terms of valuations in terms of what investors are looking for, in terms of what your employees are looking for, and the broader stakeholder community. So that was step one. Then step two was, as, as we just discussed, the 5030 initiative, which was to say, look, it's more of a cared approach. And what I mean by that is, is that if you are able to achieve this 5030 outcome, then you would get preferential treatment when it comes to dealing with the federal government in terms of doing business with them. So in terms of procurement. And so this is an area, again, to incentivize behavior uh, and desired outcomes, which promotes diversity by having this um, mechanism in place to say, look, you would be in an advantageous position compared to your peers who don't have the same 50-30 outcome in doing business with the government. So that's step two. And then step three is if we don't see meaningful change in the next few years, Mm -hmm. then I think definitely we have to look at and examine the possibilities of quotas. Okay. And, and so I think it's, you got to be, change doesn't happen overnight. It's going to, it's going to, you're going to have to have a plan in place, especially for board positions, which have three to sometimes five year terms uh, or multiple years when it comes to terms for board members. So you got to let that cycle play out and see as new opportunities emerge, are these boards actively seeking out uh, and pursuing these diversity initiatives. And if they are, then you'll start to see it, the outcomes improve. But if that does not happen, then clearly the government needs to go back to the drawing board. And I think one thing that they need to consider are quotas. 
So we're not there yet, but we're getting very close to it. I think in the next few years, if we don't see meaningful progress, you will see governments uh, re-examine some of these initiatives. So that's how I approached it. It was designed to use the legislative tools that I had in place. It was designed to use uh, government procurement as well as um, the leverage and the and the platform of the innovation department to engage stakeholders, to engage companies. And to be candid, it's it's been a, a success, at least earlier on, in terms of the number of companies that have signed up. I vividly recall when this initiative was started, there was skepticism around the number of companies that would sign up. And now the, the number is well over a thousand uh, and, and, and growing. And so I think that is a testament uh, to the momentum this is gaining. Um, and again, this falls under the broader uh, imperative around ESG as well. And companies recognize that um, that's also important uh, in this environment. Well, okay, thank you. Like you've you've enlightened me, and I'm sure you've enlightened every other person. So this is like a phased approach. Uh, let's do step one. Let's do step two. If step two is not yielding result, then we move to step three. I'm I'm very happy. I'm a lot more comfortable <laughs> to to learn that this is not just something we are going to leave to chance because I also believe chance doesn't exist. We got to be strategic about it. Uh, so now from the parliament here to the boardroom, so to speak, um, are they working together? I think when we watch the news, we see the banks, they lobby the government for financial gains and opportunities. Uh, is, is, is there lobbying going on on both sides to ensure that corporate Canada uh, do more uh, for minoritized people and do more to eliminate uh, racism and discrimination and hate as well? I think so. Uh, this is something that I've experienced at the bank, at CIBC. As you mentioned, Victor Dodig has shown tremendous leadership in this space. He talks about his personal journey yes. uh, as, uh, as an immigrant uh, and about his family. Uh, and then he talks about creating a more inclusive work environment. As you say, there's so many different work streams in place and groups in place from different backgrounds that are able to support one another, network with one another, mentor one another, and ultimately create a path for these individuals to move up the leadership ranks. And so, uh, it, again, the tone is set from the top, and Victor has definitely done that. And when it comes to dealing with the government, uh, absolutely, you were leading by example at the bank, but talking about initiatives around creating more fairness in this space. And and candidly speaking, I think the 50-30 initiative is one area, though, truth be told, where banks can do more mm -hmm. and should do more. And there is, they definitely are aligned. And, uh, you know, especially CIBC is very much aligned in this space. And so the idea is how can they use these platforms now to amplify the message, uh, not only within government, but for example, with their customers and their clients, with their suppliers. I think that's where large organizations play a unique role along with government is that they have the ability to influence uh, their orbit or the people within their orbit or organizations that are part of that circle. And that's really important as well to say, look, we care about this. We're taking meaningful steps and we'd like you to join us along this journey as well. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And, you know, when when I was uh, reading your work, which I've done, I've been following you for a while. Um, and, and something that always comes to my mind, uh, research and development, science and innovation. Like when you want to talk social justice, you would expect Minister of Justice <laughs> to talk about social justice or some lawyer or some of uh, these people that may have uh, contact with the law. And I'm like, OK, I've never really thought about it. Uh, Dr. Jennifer Fraser spoke just now saying that racism is actually wired, not a, just a mindset, like, like it is wired, like they can prove. And she also said that, you know, when you look at somebody who's going through challenges, there's a part of the brain that leads up along with somebody who have empathy. So empathy can show on the brain. With your massive uh, knowledge uh, in this space, how can science uh, be more leveraged? Research and development and innovation, we kind of know about, but science, and that experience, how can it be leveraged more to support, uh, uh, to break down systemic barriers, so to speak? Yeah, again, it depends on where the funds go, where the resources go. Do they go to people of diverse backgrounds with diverse perspectives uh, to do unique uh, tailored research in this space, right? And more broadly speaking. And I think fundamentally, it's also important, again, going back to what I said before, which is 
it's all about leadership. So you want to make sure not only do resources get allocated in terms of more funding for science uh, and research for BIPOC communities and the work that they're doing around social justice issues, as, as you mentioned, but also who's making the decisions? How are they looking at this? It's important to have people in leadership roles uh, from diverse backgrounds so that they can actually put the right ideas in motion. I think that's really important to note as well is that you, it's got to be a bottom-up approach, but you also need to make sure at the leadership level, there's a clear understanding that that dynamic needs to change and that you need to truly have not only people of diverse backgrounds, but they need to be empowered and included in the decision-making when it comes to if it's corporate objectives and goals or if it's government policies or initiatives. Thank you so much for that. I don't. Uh, we have a few minutes left. Uh, Henry Luyombia, I'm not working in the chat, uh, but is there a burning question, uh, uh, somebody type in there or something that you are picking up? Henry Leombia, any quick one? Because I, I, I have lots of questions, but uh, we want to give other people any opportunity. Chris, go ahead. Thank you. I mean, there, there's so much. I, maybe not even, I'll, I will find a question. I do have many. So I was trying to pick one in my brain. Uh, as someone said, there's so much information we're trying to absorb in these two days, but um, one thing that really came up for me was just listening to you speak. Uh, we've had lots of sort of complaints about government officials. And so when we heard from Senator Bernadette Clement yesterday, um, hearing about the work that you've done in innovation, uh, you know, it's hopeful. It's hopeful that that change is coming. And so I just want to thank you for that and for your leadership. And my question really comes from all of us that are trying, we want everything to be better. We like the sense of urgency is so strong. So maybe you can share with us, where do you get the patience um, to keep going? Because you come across so calm, cool, collected, and patient. We know the hurdles are great and many. So maybe you can share some wisdom with us in, in how do you have the patience to slowly maybe chunk away at, at progress? Well, thank you for that question. You know, it's, 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 a, it's a journey that I've been on for a number of years. Just by my sheer appearance, I've encountered many challenges as as was highlighted by Alex before, I was stopped at the airport uh, numerous times, but a very, in particular, a very difficult situation once where they asked me to remove my turban without any due cause. And ultimately, I was able to address that issue and get those individuals that made this request or demanded this uh, get retrained and they changed the manual and they fixed this uh, policy in the U.S., it also, in this journey as well, there's been a lot of mentors, allies, and supporters that have helped me uh, understand that this is going to be an ongoing challenge and that you got to keep at it and you're going to get some wins and you're going to have some uh, positive momentum, but there'll be days where there'll be minor setbacks or disappointments. And this is part of the journey. It's going to be a bit bumpy, but ultimately it should be moving in the right direction. And it is, in my humble opinion. And one ally and one person in particular who stepped up in a big way um, was the former president of the United States, Barack Obama. Uh, this was in 2016. I was part of the Canadian delegation that attended the U.S. state dinner. This was shortly after we formed government in 2015. And I was just named the Minister of Innovation, Science and Industry. And before the dinner, I reached out to uh, embassy staff and protocol and all the key heads of security and saying, look, I'm going to be attending the dinner, but I am a person who practices my faith and I wear a kirpan uh, as part of that uh, practice. Uh, and this is an article of faith and it is by no means a weapon, but I want to let you know in advance. They said, absolutely no problem. You can attend with your kirpan on. And then when I went to the state dinner, just as I'm about to get onto the bus that was going to drive us to the White House, uh, the security personnel would not let me through. And uh, held me up for about solid, I would say, 25, 30 minutes. And I explained, look, bottom line is I'm being proactive. This is not a weapon. I'm at the state dinner where I'll be having dinner with the president. And I'm like literally a table away and you're serving, uh, you know, beef, etc. And people have knives and forks. Trust me, like me trying to go underneath my shirt and trying to pull out something that is not dangerous is is not a problem compared to some of the other potential um, issues that may emerge if you're really concerned about the president's safety. Long story short, the president found out uh, and he was deeply offended and disappointed this happened. He quickly spoke to his chief of staff that spoke to security and said, unless there's something clearly here that's deemed to be a security threat, 
Nav should not be held back. Ultimately, I was let through. I spoke to the president about it. And that set the send a very clear message to his team, the security team, uh, to other guests that were there. And so when I'm feeling frustrated and let down, I think of moments like that where people in positions of authority and leadership went out of their way to support me and back me up. And so the onus is on me to do the same thing. And I think that's where, um, or that's the mindset I have uh, in dealing with social justice issues is that I continue to face these challenges, but I've had many people that have had my back along this um, path. And I just need to continue to remain positive and, and look at ways to have positive outcomes, both in my previous role in government, obviously, but also in my current role in corporate Canada. Thank wow. you so much. I know Alex is jumping in. I just want to say thank, thank you for sharing that. And that's actually the intention of why we host a two-day powerful conference at the beginning of the year is to be in community people. Uh, in community with people who share our values and it is hopeful to be connected with other people doing similar work and that you know you're focusing on those that that support you and care um versus those that uh are, are throwing up obstacles so thank you what a beautiful answer thank yes you, what a beautiful very touching answer it's quite unfortunate uh that we are still at where we are like you are right there you're a guest of the president and and yet you're still subjected to that um honorable navdi baines my hands are clasped in appreciation uh for your amazing work i mean your extent work is extensive but just your humility uh, your personality and your leadership style uh, to have spent uh, your afternoon while you're in a conference jumping in and out just to join us today. Uh, words cannot express that. I'll leave one minute to you, Luyambia, to say your thank you to uh, to him. But uh, before you do, uh, what's your message to the audience? A general message. These are social justice advocates. Some of them are racialized, minoritized, marginalized in every way. You can't even, I mean, I know you can't even believe it you will because you go through it uh, and they are tired they are tired what's your one minute advice before Lyambia gives you a thanks a vote of thanks yeah no thank you Alex for actually giving me this opportunity I'm, I'm delighted to be able to share some of my experiences talk about some of the work that I've done in government uh, when I was a minister and now what I'm doing in corporate Canada but remember this is a collective effort this is not mm -hmm. an individual journey we all got a uh, all hands on deck so to speak and we got to support each other lean on each other uh, be accountable to one another. I think that's the key takeaway. It, it truly takes a village to deal with these issues. And uh, this forum is such an important example of that, of people coming together. And to your point, I know people are tired and, and frustrated and mad and angry, uh, but you're not alone. And uh, we'll continue to work on this together. And I'm confident uh, that we will make progress. Wow. Thank you. Uh, Henry Luyambia, please give our honorable uh, Minister and uh, Chief Executive, a vote of thanks on behalf of the House so he can go on with his business. Thank you so much, Honorable Navdeep. And uh, very importantly to your team, I think the name is Amba yes. and the rest of the team. They are very wonderful people. They made sure we can connect with you. And uh, from the way you present yourself, it is evident that you are a community leader, you're a community person, and we are delighted to have you at the Congress. And those words of wisdom, I'm sure they are resonating with all the delegates. I really hope that we can continue this conversation after today. On behalf of the entire Canadian Congress team and the delegates here, please accept our deepest appreciation and gratitude. Thank you to you and God bless you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. God bless you. Okay.